Lengthen. Lengthen. Go. Go, 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 go. Rowers today, like rowers of yesterday, don't row for fame. And yet, one would think this rowing team would have received a bit more of that, given their incredible accomplishment in 1936. These sons of loggers and, and fishermen coming from the woods of western Washington, they were something of a shock and, and a, uh, very much a breath of fresh air. Boats back then were filled with sons of senators from Ivy League schools, not boys who could barely scrape enough money together to attend a state college. But these University of Washington rowing team members not only beat the odds to win against teams in the U.S., they went on to win gold in the 1936 Berlin Olympics, a race watched by a swastika-wearing crowd that included Adolf Hitler. It's a story of American underdogs who reminded a Depression-era nation what could be done when everyone quite literally pulls together. In this one-on-one -on -one with author Daniel James Brown, we talk about how even he didn't know about this team's incredible feat until a neighbor's visit. This is a story that literally walked into my life one day, six years ago, uh, in the person of my neighbor, a lady I knew then only as Judy. She'd been reading one of my earlier books to her father, and he was living under hospice care at her house. He was in the last couple months of his life. And he was enjoying that book, and she asked if I'd come down to meet him. That man was Joe Rance, one of the rowing team members from Washington. His heartwarming story led Brown on a six-year journey to research the challenges of rowing, the Depression, and Nazi Germany, and ultimately write The Boys in the Boat. I did want to capture a slice of what America was like during those years, and also a slice of what Germany was like during those years, partly because I wanted people to understand in this race at the end between basically a German boat and an American boat, what was at stake symbolically with these two different value systems. This is the St. Louis Rowing Club's boathouse that we're talking with you today in, and we've got some birds joining we us. Do. You've spent a lot of time in places like this over the last several years, haven't you? Over the last couple of years, I've been in many boathouses all over the country, um, from New England to San Diego, uh, meeting lots of rowers and, and really enjoying the experience. Had you rowed at all before writing this book? I, I row with my pen. You row with your pen. <laughs> I, I had not rowed, and I still haven't rowed in any significant way. Um, it was one of the first things I worried about. The day after I decided I really wanted to write this book, it occurred to me that I was going to be writing a book about a sport that I, that I didn't participate in. So I made a point through the whole process of um, learning as much as I could from as many rowers, seeking out rowers, spending a lot of time at the shell houses. So I got lots of help from lots of rowers. But you help the reader in understanding how difficult this sport is. It's an incredibly demanding sport and I mean particularly at the Olympic level. They say that rowing an Olympic 2,000 meter race, one of the rowers puts out as much energy as if he played two NBA basketball games back to back, but he does it all in about six minutes. And he consumes as much oxygen pound for pound as a thoroughbred racehorse does at a full gallop. So the physical demands of rowing at this level are just extraordinary. I mean, they're, they're pretty much unparalleled, I think, um, in any sport that I'm aware of. But then you have the mental part of it, too, because in Washington, they row through the winter, exactly, right? Exactly, yes. And, and that's in itself is very challenging because, believe me, I've been out there. It rains and it sleets and occasionally snows, but the worst thing out on Lake Washington in January or February uh, or any time in the winter is just a terrible cold cutting wind that is always, always at, in your face or in your back or just cutting at you. And it takes an enormous amount of mental fortitude to make yourself get up every day and go do that again and again and again. And in fact, I mean, part of the process of arriving at this Olympic crew was that a lot of kids dropped out along the way because it was just, just too tough. What I love about this book is it's a history book. It's a sports saga. It's a story with some geography in it. So it has suspense with all the, the races. And it's a heartwarming story, if nothing else. And you did it all in less than 400 pages, which is pretty incredible. <laughs> 
how long did it take you to write this? The writing didn't take very long because I, I tend not to write till I know where I'm going, but the research took a, a very long time. I started this project about six years ago, and I think probably four of those years were spent just doing research. And the research uh, ran everything from um, traditional library research, looking up newspaper articles from the 1930s on microfilm, to much more unconventional things like finding out what time the uh, sun comes up in Poughkeepsie, New York on a, the day of a particular race, to a lot of conversations with the family members of the nine young men who are at the, the heart of this story. These events took place 75 years ago. And when the families of the nine rowers I'm writing about found out what I was up to, um, they were very, very eager to help. And so I sat for probably a hundred hours talking, talking to the family members and, and learning about each of their fathers or grandfathers, whatever the case might be. And uh, so the research was, uh, was very, uh, very sweeping and, and, and I just tried to take information from wherever I could get it. So you talk about the nine boys in the boat and you really feel like you get to know them as a reader. They almost become your friend. But the one that you are rooting for as a reader the most is Joe Rance. How long did you know him before he passed? Well, Joe only lived a couple of months um, after I started talking to him, and I spent as much time as I could talking to him while he was alive, and, and I think he enjoyed that a, a lot. Um, but then after Joe passed away, his daughter Judy had spent the last several years following her dad around literally with a notepad, writing down every recollection he had about this whole sequence of events. And so after Joe was gone, I spent hundreds of hours with Judy um, as she helped me sort of flesh out uh, her dad's part of the story. That explains a lot because there's so much detail in this book. I mean, that's what really transports you back 75, 80 years. A lot of the heart basically comes from, from Judy. She just adored her dad. And um, many of the sessions we had when we talked through the story involved a lot of tears on her part because he had recently passed away. But I, I couldn't have begun to write the book without her. I've heard you say that this is kind of a, a metaphor for that generation, you know, that they had humility, that they, you know, we talk about them being the greatest generation. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that metaphor? Yeah, you know, I feel pretty strongly about that. I didn't really think in these terms until I had finished the book. I didn't write the book with this in mind. But when I finished the book and I sat back and I thought, to myself, what does this story mean to me? I realized that this story of these nine young men who got in a boat and learned to pull together and do these extraordinary things is a pretty good metaphor for that generation of Americans who found themselves in the same boat of the Depression, who had to learn humility because of the suffering that they went through and had to open their hearts to one another and learn to get together and get along and, and do great things. So I, I, I do, I think it's a good metaphor for, for that generation. It's a generation I, I admire a lot. It's the generation of you know, my father and mother and my uncle and my aunts. And, um, and so in many ways, the book wound up being a tribute to that whole generation. Let's talk more about how you got to know about this generation and the facts that you gathered. Did it take you Overseas? Did you go to Berlin? I did. Um, I, it was fairly late in the process, but I did not want to write the, the last few chapters of the book, which are set in Berlin, without uh, having seen um, the race course on which this gold medal race was run. And fortunately, the, the, the regatta grounds, the race course, is still there, and it looks very much as it did in 1936. And there was a, a German gentleman there who um, showed me around. And then he led me up onto the balcony. There was a balcony on which uh, Hitler and the other Nazis stood as they watched the American boat and the German boat uh, in this race. And so I was able to get up on that balcony and stand where Hitler had stood and look out over the race course and see it from the vantage point that he did. And it was, it was kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> How so? It just felt... Well, just to, be, to stand, I think, any place where Hitler had stood and, and to sort of put yourself in his shoes even for a moment is, is unnerving. Um, but it was also very moving. I mean, that was, that was a moment at which um, I got very emotional, actually, because I thought back on those, 
on those boys and um, and all the boys who, who, who were like them who, came, who wound up coming to Germany you know ten years later um, trying to hunt Hitler down and, and so many of them died trying to do that and and so it, it turned out to be a pretty emotional moment for me actually that's a very big part of the book it's it, I love how you have while the boys are are training and becoming a team you also have what's happening in Germany and it's yeah. a side of Germany that we don't always get to hear about it. It's yeah. the pre-war Germany. Exactly. It was a period I didn't know that much about. I mean, I think we all pretty much know what happened during the war uh, once the Nazis were in power. But these were the years when the Nazis were coming to power and, and, and the dark side of Germany was just beginning to develop. And it was uh, uh, something of a revelation to me how systematic and how cynical the Nazis were in the way that they misled world opinion in those years leading up to the war. Sure, I mean you talk about the propaganda and how it even worked on a lot of the Olympians. They came back, it like did. the boys in the boat, they yes. came back saying, it's the, great. The, many of the athletes that went to Berlin in 1936 and the thousands and thousands of Americans who went to Berlin that summer, Many of them, probably most of them, came back thinking that Germany was a clean, efficient, modern, respectable, well-run country, and mostly they had admiration for it. Now, they changed their minds within a few years as events unfolded, of course, but the Germans did, were very effective in creating almost, turning Berlin into almost a movie set on which they could create a sort of fantasy uh, version of, of what Germany was. And you talk about the boys' experiences in Germany, and there's there's even parts that that kind of let you in on kind of their naivete when they. The part for me that that led me to that was when people would come up to them and say Heil Hitler, yeah, and they responded with Heil Roosevelt, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which kind of just they they didn't get what was yeah. going on. No, they didn't. I mean, they were having fun, and they they knew Hitler was they, they knew Hitler was a bad guy. He was a dictator, but that's about the extent of what they they knew or they thought about it at that point. He was just sort of a comical figure to them. It's kind of cute. Um, as Hitler entered the Olympic Stadium for the opening ceremonies, a lot of the athletes stood at uh, attention as, as Hitler and his entourage entered the stadium. The American boys, at least the boys from the rowing crew, just sort of lounged on the grass and waved at him <laughs> as he walked by on his way into the uh, into the stadium. And this is, you got this from their journals, I guess? Yes, exactly. Uh, three of them left very detailed journals of their days in Berlin, and so those were those were really useful. It's those tidbits that kind of keep you on your toes as a reader because there's these, yeah. all these interesting things. They're also the, what keep me excited as a writer because a project is, is like this is a little bit like a treasure hunt. I mean, you know the, the scope of the story, you know the big story, but then it's fun finding all the little kinds of treasures along the way that enrich it and, and bring it to life. I noticed there was a tidbit in the notes that I thought was very interesting, and that was the tidbit about the Allied troops when they were encircling Berlin at the end of Hitler's fall. Yes. What kind of boat were they using? <laughs> well, as the American troops approached Berlin from the west, they came to, I think it was the Elbe River, separating them from Berlin, and um, they had no way to get across. But the first troops there found an old abandoned German eight-oared uh, racing shell. So they climbed in it, and uh, I believe they used their rifles as paddles and made their way across the river and, uh, and on to Berlin. I mean, that's ironic in a way, isn't it? It is, yeah. Were there any other pieces that, boy, you thought, gosh, that was a great story, but I just couldn't put it in? Oh, there were a lot. You know, the only thing I, I regret is there is a, there's a point in the story where Joe is left behind by his family as a child out in the woods on the Olympic Peninsula. And it, this is just a small detail, but um, as his family piled in the car and drove away on this rainy day and left Joe sort of in shock standing on the porch watching them go, his little brother, Harry Jr., remembers that the car it was a Franklin. It had an oval back window. And Joe also remembers that, that Harry, was, Harry Jr. was saying, but what about Joe, but what about Joe? And, and Joe from the porch could see his little brother mouthing these words, but what about Joe? And it's just, it really, that, that image really touched me. And 
somehow or another it didn't make it into the book and I, I do regret that. And but Joe was how old at that time? Joe was I think 14 at that point so he was uh, you know on the verge of um, well he was an adolescent uh, but he wound up living completely on his own and having to forage in the woods for berries and poaching salmon out of the Dungeness River in order to survive. This story, you, you know, you, you wanted to build. I mean, the whole the whole book is building up to the end scene, which we know the outcome. You do. I mean, you know when you pick the book up, you know how it ends. And that was one of my challenges as a writer, of course, was to keep the suspense um, yeah, for the reader, even even knowing that. and and. But, and you know the end, and yet they're, you're questioning it throughout the book because there are so many moving parts. Yes, and exactly. Who's going to be in the boat? Is Joe going to be in the boat? Yeah. And so on and so forth. Well, and that's the way they experienced it. They, of course, didn't know how it was going to end. And, and so as much as possible, I'm letting you see the story from the vantage point of, of Joe and, and, and each of these other young men and, and experiencing it the way that they did with all the uncertainty and, and all the challenges that had, had to be overcome. That's what I mean. There, there are these roadblocks every, every page it seems for this team and then they get to Germany and I, I won't spoil it but there are <laughs> even more there. Yep. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm bringing all this up for is this is an incredible story. Like you said, you sat there in Joe Rance's, well his daughter's house and yeah. knew immediately that right. this is an awesome story. Yeah. So why did it take 75 years for somebody to write it? It's a good question. Um, I think partly that August, the Jesse Owens story, which is a great story, is a wonderful story, but it did sort of suck all the oxygen out of the air in terms of press coverage that, that August. So I suspect there are a lot of good stories from the 36 Olympics that might not have been told. And then also, these guys came back from Europe in dribs and drabs. There was no ticker tape parade or anything. There was a newspaper strike that week, uh, so one of the Seattle papers didn't have any coverage of the event at all. And so, yeah, the event just sort of faded away. Um, and uh, there, there are people of a certain age in uh, Seattle who do remember it, but for the most part, it had, it had gone away. The families, they, they met up every 10 years and had the, a race back on the lake, is that right, with yeah. these, these boys? Well, the, the crew would have an anniversary race on the every 10-year anniversary of the gold medal race. And then more than that, the families of all nine of them would just get together for barbecues and picnics through the rest of their lives. I mean, these guys were incredibly bonded together. They, they really loved each other. And even as they were very old men, they, they just, they, they always wanted to be together doing something or, or another. Obviously, Joe didn't get to read this book. They were all gone by the time the, the book was published, but um, the families of all nine of these guys were very, very excited when the book comes out, and um, that, that means a lot to me. I, you know, when I first heard this story from Joe and then I dug into it, I knew it was a great story. Before I even touched it, it just was a good story, and I just wanted to do justice to it. Um, so the fact that the family members are happy with it, uh, th that, that makes me happy. None of the nine rowing team members served in World War II. Most of them graduated college as engineers and were recruited to design aircraft for the war effort. They lived long, happy lives. Many of them saw their 90s. But now the legend of their gold medal winning bond lives on in these pages, where they will forever be known as the boys in the boat.